Welcome to another FA webinar hot topic. Um, it's my pleasure today to have Kelsey Byrne and Martin Evans with us to discuss a women's and girls specific physical demands webinar. Um, today, as you can see from the slide, we have one thing that we'd really like to discuss with everyone today, which is peak game pace training and how this is measured and why it's so important that when looking at international football and trying to bridge the gap with WSL and academy players, the future of our women's and girls game. Martin, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Kelsey as well. Uh, Martin, do you want to do a quick introduction to yourself first of all? Yeah, cool. Thanks for the intro, Mark. Um, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me to speak about this. Um, it's something of massive interest to our department. Um, my role is to oversee physical performance for the Women's Pathway national teams. So I look after everything from uh, under 15s to under 21s. Um, and then we work with the national coaches and the rest of the MDT in order to help try and achieve the uh, FA's vision of winning a major international tournament in the next four years. Um, in terms of our department, we're part of the physical performance and nutrition department. So in our department, there's... Uh, 12 full-time members and several consultant members of staff um, and we we have a range of expertise we come from a range of different backgrounds so the way that we're set up is that we try to um, identify the challenges that the national teams face and then um, those challenges or problems go to the people that are most able to solve those so we're not all trying to solve the same issue so it makes us more efficient because we are limited and we cover both men's and women's pathway so i guess with that in mind much of what i'm going to talk about today a lot of credit goes to the rest of the department for being able to collect the information that we present and also analyze, which has been a massive amount of work in just setting up systems to pull in all the data from the 15 or so national teams that we have. Brilliant. And, and Kelsey, for, for me and you as national code developers, this is a, it's a great opportunity to talk to Martin because with our support that we give to the clubs and going in and seeing what, what's going on, this can really hopefully drive forward some of the work that's going on within the WSL, the Championship, National Leagues to develop the players of the future. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. I think um, it's, a, it's a topic that, as we know, some clubs are, are really going after and really trying to enhance their knowledge on. Um, and as we know from, from our conversations, Martin, it's something that that's driving um, internationally at the minute and something you guys are striving for and, and hopefully something that the clubs are also going to take on board and start to, to really drive and push forward this season with. So, yeah, I think this will be brilliant to just outline a little bit more around what it is, um, how it can be measured um, and why it's so important really for, for both international but also domestic football. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to talk about peak pace training today, but... For some of you that would have attended Blueprint events where Martin would have presented along with some of his colleagues, this was also known as match pace training previously. Um, Martin, just want to explain why we, we changed terminology? Yeah, so um, after looking at uh, kind of exactly what it is and what it represents, we decided that peak game pace was more representative of the work that was done and exactly what it is, whereas match pace was a bit more vague. So that's officially what we've kind of um, termed it now moving forward. Brilliant. So looking forward then, okay, and in terms of what we're going to talk about, what, what, what do you mean by peak game pace training? Yeah, um, I think it's uh, worth providing some kind of context to how we got to that point. Um, because there's a number of levels of analysis that the physical performance department have taken to kind of um, understand the demand that is placed on players that are going to play in major international tournaments. Um, so for, in order for us to prepare players accordingly, um, we need to really understand what a major international tournament, the demand of it is, um, because if we don't, then we don't really have that North Star that we're kind of um, moving towards. So the first level is quite simply like the density of competition. So this is kind of how many minutes, how many games in a period of time. Like we all know, a World Cup is around 28 days or so, and you've got to play around six or seven games in that period. So um, like there is a significant demand placed there. And through the course of this webinar, we'll go into a bit more detail around that. Um, the next level of analysis is the kind of traditional GPS outputs. So we're looking at total distance, high speed outputs, sprint meters, uh, number of accelerations, decelerations. Typically, these are kind of um, 
portrayed in a 90 minute or average game duration. Um, but this doesn't tell you the whole picture because when you start to boil down a metric such as total distance, which may be about 10K in a game, you start to break that down. That's 5K per half. And then you boil that down to a minute and it's actually a really slow walk. So if we only prepare players to do a really slow walk, we're not really preparing players for the demand that they're going to face within a game because we all know that it's a series of high intensity actions with low lower recovery periods in between. Um, and so that's where the peak game pace comes in and it can be defined as the benchmark that defines the most demanding periods of the game. And how we've kind of um, looked to establish this is analyze what happens in that uh, rolling one minute, rolling two minute, rolling three minute sort of time periods to understand what our players are doing in those kind of intensive periods so that we can prepare players accordingly uh, for that. Um, the last level of analysis, which is kind of um, the next frontier, I guess, for us, and we'll touch more briefly on this at the end of the kind of uh, pre uh, webinar, is around how the tactical kind of or game state interacts with that um, peak game demands because it's critical to know what is happening. So when we hit like a really hard passage of play, what are we doing? Are we in possession, out of possession at a mo most basic level? But then there's obviously other um, kind of elements of the game that will be important to understand because that will help further design our training to appropriately pe prepare players for what they're going to face. And so I think Martin, this... just on that, um, why is that, do you think, important then for domestic football and for coaches listening? Why, why is match pace training important for, for those coaches to try and achieve and aspire to? Yeah, no, good point. And um, I guess the first point would be around um, within the leagues that the players are playing in, there will be a similar sort of demand. Um, and we started to look at some games and we started to try and understand what the demand of the WSL is. So players need to be prepared first and foremost for that demand as well. So if you don't know what the peak game pace demands are, then how can you truly know if you're preparing your players for what they're going to face within the league? So if then you know that and you can prepare players for it, then they're more likely to not only survive a season, but thrive in those situations of high intensity action. And that's obviously crit critically important for teams that are looking to be successful. And then if you apply that to the um, Champions League, um, where some of the bigger clubs are looking to go, I'm guessing that there is likely a step up in the level of competition there as well. If we look at the recent um, Lyon and Wolfsburg games, like mm -hmm. they were pretty intense in certain phases of play. So are we prepared for those demands? So clubs with that kind of aspiration need to understand it as well. And then I guess for the bit that kind of um, joins national teams up with clubs is that those players that are going to play for national teams, whether they play for England or other national teams, they've got to transition between those environments and perform in the most demanding environment. So if we can share this information and prepare players to cope, uh, well, not only cope, but thrive in those situations where they're being asked to do their most demanding work, then that player is more available for the club and the national team across the course of the season. The challenge that the national teams have is that we obviously don't see the players for the whole year and we only see them for periods of time. So we can't adequately prepare them for all of those demands. And so there's there needs to be a lot of collaboration with the clubs in order to make sure that that player is capable of coping with that demand and thriving in the situations they need to. Yeah. So in terms of that, I know we spoke about... Um, the density, and you start to speak about the density of potentially an international tournament. Um, what are the typical demands of um, an international tournament or a typical domestic season? What would that look like? Yeah, um, so from a density perspective, uh, um, I guess the summary is that a major international tournament requires England players to compete numerous times in a short period of time. And it looks quite different um, depending on the age group of the players. So in the pathway, so for example, we have World Cups at under 18s and under 20s. Um, these kind of look like tournaments that will last about 19 or so days and you have to compete in six games. Um, I guess the added thing with tournaments is there's the um, challenge of extra time as well. And most tournaments um, from our analysis seem to suggest that players will have to compete in extra time at least once. So we're looking at around 600 minutes uh, of match play in about 19 days. 
um, the, which is even more dense than the women's senior schedule, for example. So the women's seniors World Cup tends to be more like 28 days in duration with an extra game, so seven games in 28. Um, and But I guess the added challenge that they have is that they're more likely to go to extra time in more than one game. So in that, we might be looking at around 730 minutes in 28 days across the whole tournament. Um, but obviously that doesn't tell the whole story, but it starts to give you a scale of the demand that these players might have to face. Yeah, so I'm guessing then the, the WSL Academy coaches there um, and the under-16 RTC coaches have got some work to do to try and support that that demand for especially the under-17s and under-20s and, and that real high demand. Um, and we've got an example here as well of, of the WSL and what that could potentially look like. Um, it's I know that some of these days are potentially longer than what you get, Martin, on camp, um, especially the 10-day, um, but that just shows there that Actually, there's quite a lot of heavy um, games where, where the opposition is is quite high in terms of the Champions League and then the WSL. In so, so Martin, just on that, then in terms of when you look at that that slide regarding um, Arsenal season in terms of Atletico and 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 the teams that they're playing in the WSL. What, how, how well does that marry up with the sort of work that you've been doing with national teams? Would that be something you'd expect coaches and, and staff to be thinking about the demands and how they, they tailor their, their week's training? Yeah, 100%. And um, the slides you've got on screen starts to show um, an example of what a senior England international season might look like in terms of density of minutes. Um, mm. So within that, you kind of got all of the games that they've played um, and what you can kind of see is the peaks. So on the far left, you can kind of see that across five games, there was 472 minutes accrued. Um, later in the season, then there was 591 minutes in six games. But then when we look at the World Cup, we're looking at a big gap of about 22% um, where that player could be exposed to far more minutes because of the, the structure of the competition. So again, it comes back to that, that collaboration piece of how we work together to ensure that this player is capable of um, meeting and exceeding this demand that they will face um, within that. And I guess one of the really interesting things is that this player, and th this is a fairly typical example for a senior player going into a major international tournament, the gap, um, like there was nowhere near the density of that level of competition faced within the three months leading up to that tournament. So just mm -hmm. from a preparation perspective, you, you're starting to have um, some alarm bells essentially is like, is this player going to cope with this demand? Cause mm -hmm. like we all know those kind of massive increases in training load are the things that tend to cause issues in terms of injury and things like that. So how can we bridge that gap? That's, that's the first level of analysis. Yeah. And, and would you, would you say then just, you know, just looking at this, graph in terms of minutes played would you say then actually playing more games would support this or is it just linked to the, the training demands it's a really interesting question and i don't think i can give a concrete answer right now because like on one hand yes playing more games would be part of the equation but then there's also the fatigue that comes with that yeah and so it's a kind of a balance. It's like looking at that player and how they cope with that demand because it might be better that this player um, has additional training in order to support that capacity or capability to cope with the demand rather yeah. than just exposing them to more games. But I yeah. think it's a, it has to be that collaborative approach because it has to be what's best for the player and each player is going to react differently to it. Some players might cope well with the increased um, density of playing and need minimal kind of work alongside that to make sure they they fit in, they're able to cope with that demand, whereas other players might need the reverses, uh, kind of like less game time in order to allow them to raise their kind of, um, I guess, their kind of floor up more so that they're more able to cope with the demands of games. Yeah. And, and I suppose then that the point that's probably worth making at this point is that every player is different, and, and this is the challenge of this kind of work, that not one size fits all and it's really important that whatever you do is is related to the individual players so no players is is vital in in this process and trying to develop this peak game idea yeah 100 percent. 
Yeah, and just just adding on to that, Mark, um, it was interesting, obviously, the case study there, Martin, that you've just gone through, is a player that you would expect is playing quite regular for club and playing quite regular uh, internationally. How might that differ if a player is playing intermittently for club, sometimes starts, sometimes doesn't, sometimes gets a few minutes and potentially doesn't start all international games? What What does that then look like? Yeah, and again, this is kind of a sort of example of how that might look across the season that um, doesn't get as many regular minutes for their club. It basically increases that gap. So if that player um, is a key player for the national team and isn't getting exposed to minutes, then it probably um, increases that demand for them to be doing supplementary work in order to ensure they are capable. And I guess it's one of the challenges is about um, how you maintain the physical capability of the players that aren't playing regularly. And like time is always tight, but that, that's one of the big challenges. It's the same within an international environment. Is like to win a tournament, most teams tend to stay with a, a relatively consistent um, starting 11. And so how do you maintain the physical capability of the players that aren't getting that exposure to the minutes within that environment so that if they have to step in the later stages that they're able to step into that intensity. Um, so imagine a player has to come in at the semi-final level, but hasn't played up to that point. Like what are you doing to make sure that they're um, ready to cope with that demand? And it's exactly the same for clubs is like, if a player has to step in, are you confident that they're ready? Yeah, I think that's the, that's a great point, Martin. I think that's probably some of the things that the clubs will will find with their their work during the weeks, and and obviously players getting injured and and players then having to step in. That are they able to to really raise their game and and come in at the demand that that's required to compete at the highest level? Touched on there um, a season or an international um, fixture. Um, and the densities of multiple games. Um, but what contributing factors can influence just a single game's outputs uh, and, and the outputs that you might get from, from just a single game? What does that look like? Yeah, and there's a number of factors that go into it. Um, so I guess it's worth noting up front uh, the most recent FIFA report um, showing a comparison of 2015 World Cup to 2019 World Cup shows an evolu evolution in the women's game. So essentially what it shows is that there's more high intensity um, actions and that's evidence to the number of, uh, or the amount of high speed running, the amount of sprint distance and the number of accelerate, hard de accelerations and decelerations. So what we're seeing is that the world is getting um, fitter, faster, stronger essentially, and is demonstrating that in games. So that for us increases the challenge of winning a World Cup because it means to be the elite, we're going to have to be even more capable than some of the lesser teams that are now starting to have um, like really good physical capability and able to work hard within games. And that, I think, comes with the women's game growing and more um, federations investing in the national team. And I think that's only going to get um, better for the women's game, but ultimately harder for us to win a tournament. Um, and I guess what then we see within games is that as the tournament progresses, typically you start to face the um, the harder teams later in the tournament, so in the knockout stages, obviously, because the better teams tend to get to that point. And then those are the games that tend to um, elicit our highest outputs because we're having to work harder to either get the ball back or work harder to break them down. Um, and I guess that, that, again, is one of the other challenges that we face as an international team is that we got the kind of paradox that um, the level of competition is in ri is rising, but typically because of the density that we face, our level of fatigue is also rising. So we're going into games where we have to perform a, a probably our, our highest physical capability with our highest level of fatigue um, and consequently uh, a lesser physical capability or some people like to refer to it as freshness. And so that's another challenge that we're facing in that. And in those latter stages, particularly in some of the age grade tournaments, the turnarounds between games can be really short. So as little as uh, 48 or 72 hours, which 
if you look at kind of basic uh, physiology, probably isn't enough time to recover, but that's the tournament demand that we're faced with. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a challenge in itself. And in the domestic game, there are probably a number of parallels, like the example you showed previously. If you've got Champions League commitments alongside the, the fixture schedule has been um, probably unfavorable in this situation where you're facing higher uh, ranked WSL teams, you might have a series of very challenging games where you want to start with a similar starting 11 because they're your strongest 11, but the demand is highest. So you may be experiencing that high level of fatigue that we see in those later stages as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you even compare that to the WSL Academy or RTCs, where they potentially have players that play um, school football, county football, university football, they could be um, two two games a week. So it could be um, two games a week because the fixture list logs up after Christmas and then that, that, that density starts to yeah. increase as well. So... And then you've got the, the highest demand um, on the bigger games and, and the biggest demands of the biggest games. And there's, a, there's obviously a gap between the two. So how could that affect a player's performance, having that gap? And, and why is it really important that we, sh- we close the gap, really? Yeah, and um, we've put together this graphic. I say we, as in the physical performance and nutrition team, have put this together to try and kind of, um, I guess, explain this in simplistic terms. So at the top, we got the physical demands of winning major international tournaments, which is what we started to talk about. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got the demands that a player is prepared for. And then the bit in between, which is the distance between those two components, is essentially the gap or the cost. So the bigger that gap, the greater the cost. And the outcomes of this are obviously increased levels of fatigue. So you may start to see players um, struggle towards the later half of games, in a tournament, we may see struggle players start to struggle earlier in um, like later stage games if they've played a lot of minutes. This has an impact on decision making. So obviously, when you're fatigued, you make um, worse decisions, um, or you make decisions too slow, which, like the graphic says, um, leads to more mistakes, which potentially lead to goals or potentially more fouls, which may lead to a red card, which then further disadvantages your team in that situation because you got one less player with a and you've already got a significant amount of fatigue against probably a stronger opposition. So it all kinds of starts to mesh together into a real serious problem. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like linking to the fatigue point, you don't recover fully between games. So if you get through that game and say that's a semi-final um, and you get to the final, you you probably haven't fully recovered again. So you're starting from a lower point um, and then, that last point kind of links it all together where you've got reduced squad availability. So it just further compounds that problem of you've got um, higher level competition and um, you've got increasing levels of fatigue, but with less of a squad available to support that, um, that challenge. Um, so it kind of becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. Yeah, perfect. And we've got here as well that you can replace that that winning of international to just actually meeting the physical demands of being able to compete in games, um, whatever game that be might be. Um, and I suppose the next question is, we know that the demands of winning games are not going to reduce. And, and as you said from the FIFA reports, that they seem to be getting um, greater and greater. So if we start to think about, you know, how do you measure what those demands actually are to, to be really clear on this is what we're trying to get the players to and this is what we believe will prepare the players to strive and survive in those games. Yeah, and um, before I talk more, because you're probably sick to death of hearing me talk, um, we've actually prepared a short video that we're using internally at the minute. Um, So if we can play that. To develop and prepare for the physical demands of international football, players need to train at and above these demands. To measure this, We use the most demanding periods of the game to compare how our training intensity relates to the way we play. We look at this in two ways. Firstly, we look at each player's extensive work rate. This is the maximum distance covered in a given period of time, and these efforts typically represent the counter-attacking transitions that occur during a game. So as an example, the one minute extensive work rate shown here is the maximum distance this player covered in any one minute period during the game. The next thing we look at is the intensive demands. 
This is the highest number of accelerations and decelerations in a given period and typically represents the pressing and 1v1 nature of the game. Again, as an example, three minute intensive demands could be five hard accelerations every minute for three minutes. By using this information, it means we can accurately compare the extensive and intensive demands of our training to the highest demands of international match play. Additional to this, in the planning process, it is vital to include the prescription and training dose of high speed running and maximum sprint speed efforts in the planning and periodization. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of how we've started to um, approach this challenge of looking at peak game pace. Um, obviously in this, we're referring to using GPS to understand um, like what our players are experiencing. And I guess um, for some clubs, um, particularly like academy level and RTC level, they may not have access to GPS. Mm -hmm. So whilst there's probably not as a, an objective a way of quantifying it, there are definitely things that you could do to start making sure that you are preparing the players for the intensity that they're going to face. So um, Kelsey and I actually spoke previously about this and there are, I guess, a number of ideas that you could look at. Like the first one could be looking at um, if you're videoing games and training, is you can start to look at um, what players are doing in those intensive periods of action. So how many hard accelerations, decelerations are they doing? How much like kind of um, high speed running are they doing? And as, admittedly, it won't be um, as kind of objective, like I said, as the GPS output, but it starts to give you a flavor of what the demands of the level of competition you're looking at. If you don't have video, then you're kind of looking maybe at more of an RPE type approach. Um, so you can start to look at in games, what, what demands are the players experience and how hard do they think it is? And uh, maybe asking them to think about specific periods within the game. So in that, um, say, high pressing period where you did six or seven hard accelerations in a minute, how hard was that? Getting their feel for it. And then when you come to training, similar sort of idea is, setting up drills or training uh, structures that kind of expose them to that and then asking them for feedback on how hard they found it that might be a way that could work that's to kind of if you don't have gps at the lower levels in order to kind of uh, make sure you're training at sufficient intensity um i guess one point about rpe that i learned early on in my career as a um, sc coach is that don't ask them to write it all up on a whiteboard or a white sheet because basically whatever the first person puts up, they all gravitate to one point either side of it. So try and get it in some kind of um, blinded format. We currently use um, iPads to collect them and we get a much greater variance in the RP reported, which is, is good because it shows that um, it kind of RP is good because it brings um, how the player is feeling. So they might have external stresses such as exams going on at the same time. So they might be feeling a drill that they normally find a five or six as a seven or eight because they've got other stresses going on. They might have had a bad night's sleep, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, that is useful information because it gives you more individualized feedback for that player in that moment in time. Yeah. Do you find, Martin, when you actually collect the RPs is important? Because I'm guessing the player will only give you the result based on their last activity. So, for example, if you only take it at the beginning and at the end and there's an hour and a half period in between, you don't quite get that the same result. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, 100%. Um, so if you're looking at um, getting RPE for a specific drill, then you want to take it immediately after or as close as possible to, because like you say, like everyone only really remembers the last thing they, they did. So if you ask them at the end of the session, they're going to give you an average for that session, which mm -hmm. going back to the GPS example is similar in that it's going to be an average of that entire period, which may not be reflective of the peaks. So mm -hmm. if you want to try and understand the peaks, you may just uh, say you're doing a three minute drill where you're trying to achieve um, some high intensity actions is ask them just for a quick um, subjective. How hard was that on a scale of one to 10 or whatever scale you decide to use? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So then that leads in there, Martin. Then for coaches listening, how would you recommend then that we start to close the performance gaps to condition and prepare players for the future game by, you know, using training opportunities to, to develop this? 
Yeah. Um, and I guess this starts to get into the crux of the, the peak game pace concept. Um, and where we're looking at is we have limited time with the players, um, mm. but we want to make sure that they have been exposed to um, the peak game demands that we're seeing in international competition, because that will give us a greater degree of confidence that they're able in that moment where it matters to be able to do what they need to do. Um, so um, if we look at that kind of uh, example earlier that Dawn gave of um, that peak in st extensive stuff, um, we're looking at if we want to go after that, um, getting drills that kind of replicate that demand. So if it's 207 meters per minute, are we able to set up a drill um, with the similar sort of tactical constraint um, that enable that player to experience that um, work and then they can be exposed to making those decisions under that same level of physical stress. Um, and so we're looking at comparing that training to the match demands. Um, and we've got a little bit later on about how the, the GPS report that we've built allows us to do that, um, to be able to feed back to coaches to kind of give them an idea of how um, how we're kind of starting to do that. So it's, it's, to one of the worries is what we're not saying is to go out just 100% the whole time. Uh, so how do we allow these attempts to come do this for 100% of the training? Then fatigue and injury is going to become a major part of the training week. Yeah, and it's a really good question that's actually very hard to answer. Um, so... You, you're right, you can't train 100% all of the time. Um, so you need to understand um, where the players are at physically. So what's their physical capability? How fit, fast, strong are they essentially? Because that will give you an idea of what they're going to be able to tolerate. And then also once you understand where the demands of the game are and where your training currently sits against that, you almost need to create a roadmap of how you're going to um, increase either the intensity. So if your match play is, say we're using RPEs and it's 10 out of 10 for those hard peaks, but our training, our worst hard training is only six out of 10, there's an intensity gap there that needs to be filled. So that will probably be my first thing is, can we expose them to a low volume of uh, higher intensity training in order to make sure they're being exposed to that, not just in matches, because being exposed to, 10 out of 10 only once per week is probably not going to prepare them to do that repeatedly across the course of a season, which may be a factor then in injuries. The other thing then is that if you are hitting the intensity in training is looking at the volume of that. So if you're only yeah. hitting that intensity um, once every couple of weeks or for a very short period of time within a given week, you may need to look at doing more work at that high intensity to ensure that there's an adequate training response so that when they get to match day, they're more than comfortable of coping with that demand. Um, so it is very much dependent on all those kind of factors. Um, <clears throat> and from our perspective, um, like we've kind of created a, bit, a, a set of principles of how we might look at it. Yeah. Um, so we need to look at what we're trying to achieve on camp. Sometimes it's not appropriate to do it. So sometimes um, in international settings, particularly in like the age grades, we might travel to uh, somewhere, usually Eastern Europe. I don't know why, but it always seems to be Eastern Europe. Um, and we've got a match day minus one, and then we're into three games with two days recovery in between each game. In that situation, there's probably not a great deal of work that we can do around peak game pace exposure because we've got those three games in such a short period of time and such a limited prep in time. So we might only do... Um, a couple of minutes on match day minus one um, to get them to feel what they're going to experience that coming day. And that might be it for that that phase. Um, so that's really important to understand is like where the players are at, what they've come from and what they're going into, because that will help you build your roadmap. Um, and it needs to have a kind of a long-term objective across the course of a season. Um, so going back to the previous point around if your gap is in intensity, how are you going to bridge that? But then you need to look at how that may work in those kind of shorter time periods. So in there, we've kind of categorized our lead-ins to international tournaments as long, medium or short. Um, so long is, is four days, which is a luxury. Uh, medium is three days. And then short is just that one to two days that is quite common, particularly in the pathway teams. 
Um, so there's a lot of considerations that go on there. And it's putting it all together with the technical, tactical coaches in order to make sure that we're achieving what we need to. Um, and then uh, that is where the kind of um, conversation is about devising that training that's appropriate for that moment in time. Yeah, and I guess, Martin, kind of adding on to that, that for the domestic um, leagues and for those coaches listening in, that their long, medium and short might look slightly longer than yours, um, but can almost be broken down into a similar process where you can potentially get different types of demands and outputs out of those, whether that's a 10-day, 7-day or a 3-day. So... We put an example here of Man City and, and their lead, and you've got there a 13-day lead in, um, and what you can expose the players to, I'm guessing, will look very, very different to the two-day lead in that's at the end after um, a Champions League and after playing Arsenal <laughs> within the within the league. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. The the longer you have, the more time you have to expose players to that, and the more necessary it is because if you don't expose them to it with that sort of 13-day gap then they're probably not going to be prepared for that game particularly if it's champions league in that um that that upcoming fixture so i think it's critical but it does give you much more flexibility in how you plan it so there are numerous um methods proposed in various literature around like how you can structure it um like we tend to go with this intensive extensive ideas other people use different terminology such as strength um, endurance, etc. Um, it all kind of largely relates to the same thing, but I think it's just being clear with what you're trying to do and then how you're going to do it and having that plan. But then don't be afraid based on how players are reacting to that plan to either scale it up or scale it um, down because sometimes you might have the best plan in the world, but the players ain't ready for it. <laughs> um, so if you continue to push it, you're probably going to break them. Um, conversely, like if you undercook uh, them then it's equally as bad as overcooking them like as in they won't be prepared mm -hmm. for the demand they're going to face in that upcoming game so i think it's important that you have a plan but then you work your plan in order to make it um fit to the current situation that you've got in front of you so martin if we link that back into specific sessions and practices then that might help prepare the players for especially this short short lead-in, um, the two-day lead-ins, where we're not going to necessarily get lots of work in there, that a lot of the work might happen prior. What might some of those training sessions look like to help us bridge these gaps and reduce the cost to these players? Um, with the short lead-ins, your ability to do large amounts of peak game pace is obviously very limited because you, you're conscious of what's coming up, which is the games. Um, so in those situations, we're looking about prioritizing technical, tactical work to prepare for what's coming up. Um, but there are obviously a number of considerations about um, the peak game pace, the amount of it that you can do and the intensity is um, what the physical capability of the players are, what they've come from and then what's coming up. The more time you have available prior to that competition or fixture, the greater your flexibility to do more kind of this um, peak game pace work um, because you've got the opportunity to do it and recover. The same considerations still apply in terms of you need to know uh, the capability of your players, um, what's coming up and what they've come from. But like I said, the longer that lead in, the more flexibility you have in order to kind of like manipulate training to achieve those integrated outcomes. And I, I guess that's the point of peak game pace training is that how can we expose those players to make those decisions under the situations that are going to occur in um, match play when it's at the highest level. And if we don't expose them to that in training regularly, they're not going to be prepared to do that in the game. Yeah, perfect. And we've got a little video now that kind of brings that to life really and starts to, to discuss the differences between um, what we can see in the game and, and what we see in training and how we start to close that gap. Yeah, and this is very much based on... Uh, like the international situation at present. And this is probably a good reflection of where we're at and where we need to go. Now the question is, does the intensity of training currently reflect the intensity of competition? The answer is simply, no, it does not. 
Let's look at the extensive work rate. At its most intense, extensive demands can peak at 207 meters per minute during international game, more than running two pitch lengths in a minute. As effort duration increases, i.e. longer passages of play, work rate will typically decrease. How does this compare to the extensive efforts in our training drills of similar duration? Training is currently 30 to 40 meters per minute, which is around 25 to 30% below the work rates we should expect when competing against international opposition. As we've already seen, these match demands are evolving and continuing to increase. If we take the intensive demands, our one minute intensive demands can peak at eight hard accelerations per minute during international football. And this is around four times greater than the average demands of the game. This intensity again decreases as the effort duration increases. But again, if we look where the intensity of our training currently is, we have an extra three to four hard accelerations per minute to go before we hit the intensities we frequently face during games against top international opponents. These are the gaps we need to close. I guess there what you can kind of see is that um, there is a gap in between how we train and how we play, which going back to that graphic that we talked about earlier, that's just one another gap. So we've got that density gap. Um, we're probably, from an absolute metrics perspective, we're probably okay in that we're covering enough distance and things like that because that probably doesn't tell us all of the story about what, those, um, what demand the players are facing in a game. But then what you can quite clearly see there is the, the gap between in that worst one minute, in that worst two minute, three minute, et cetera, is this is what we're playing at, but this is where we're training at present. So we aren't preparing players for the demand they're going to face in international competition. So that like is where we're at. And that is what we need to try and do in order to start to bridge that gap is um, expose players to the situations they're going to face in games so that when they get to games, it's not alien, because if those stresses are unaccustomed to them, that's when things go wrong, typically. So we need to make sure that they're prepared for it. So, Martin, I think we've got another video coming up, which sort of gives us a practical example from, from training. Um, if you watch that first, and you just want to sort of link how the two work together, it would be great. Yeah. Now we will showcase some of the examples of how these concepts have been put into action and have been used in the women's pathway. This first example comes from one of Rianne's under 21 sessions. This session was on a training camp when the team were away from competition. As such, there was opportunity to stretch players and condition them for the intense periods in a game that they would encounter in the tournament to come. To do this, a transition drill was utilized Technical objectives here include look forward, play forward, recovering into shape and quality of end product. Physical objectives include extensive meters per minute and high speed running exposure. Principles used to dial up intensity for this drill include underloaded team with 7v8, short durations, three minute blocks were used to keep the quality of the work high, less touches, a rule of second seconds to score and regain would mean less touches on the ball. Pitch sizes, large pitch sizes were used to achieve extensive game pace. This was further supported with additional rules. Firstly, recover into own half in open play as quickly as possible when out of possession. And squeeze up, you must be on the halfway line for a goal to count when in possession. The bar chart shows the success of this drill in achieving extensive game pace. It is a good example of how we can attend to technical objectives whilst applying a stretch on the demands they would experience in game winning moments. So yeah, that's just one example of how it could be done. Um, obviously relates to the more extensive side of things. So from a GPS perspective, we're looking at um, meters per minute covered. So we're looking to achieve um, the relevant game pace threshold. So that drill, for example, was three minutes. So we're comparing that against a three minute extensive threshold uh, that we've seen in international uh, matches. Um, this on the screen now is some examples of uh, reports that we use. And um, there's a lot of things going on there, but we basically categorized um, training into four zones. 
So at the lowest zone is what we call consolidation. And this is um, probably where uh, a lot of learning might take place. And this might be uh, a walkthrough or a set place, uh, set piece type activity, which is fairly slow um, fairly like it's not about um, physical outputs and things. And then on the other end of the continuum, we've got the red zone, which is the conditioning. And this is where it exceeds game base for that given threshold. So I think that's a really important point is that we're comparing um, the threshold against the duration of the drill. So you wouldn't compare a three minute drill against the one minute drill, uh, against the one minute peak game pace, because they're obviously gonna be different. Mm -hmm. So it's important, it's one factor in the drill design is like what are you trying to achieve? So understanding that and then um, having the appropriate metrics to kind of compare against. Um, and then in between the kind of consolidation and conditioning is, um, are you achieving game pace, which is the next level down from conditioning? So if you're within sort of 10% or so, so that's indicated by the amber. And then we've actually termed the bit that fill falls between um, consolidation and game pace as junk. Um, and that was purposeful because in that zone, um, you actually do quite a bit of work, but you're not actually exposing them to the demands that they're gonna face. And therefore it comes at a cost which is fatigue, which when we go back to that um, bigger discussion about the gap and the cost, like fatigue, fatigue um, has an impact on the ability to do other things. So it's not to say that you shouldn't go in the junk zone, but it's definitely a consideration about minimizing the amount of work you do in that area because it comes with a cost without any real reward. Whereas mm -hmm. like you can polarize your training more to those two ends of conditioning and game pace and consolidation you can actually manage fatigue a little better. Um, this slide here just kind of shows within that drill uh, how it's reported back, how many players are achieving game pace. So what we've got is um, positions on the left-hand side and then the red indicates that they were achieving a conditioning stimulus, which is above game pace, which is a positive thing. They were going above the three-minute threshold for peak game pace. And then the players in amber were achieving game pace. So of the 18 or so in that drill, I think 13 were achieving a conditioning level stimulus, which is a really great output for a drill such as that. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously biased towards the extensive, um, which sometimes has an impact on the intensive output. So that's another consideration when putting together training is if your drill overly biases one aspect, where are you going to hit the other aspect of the mm -hmm. intensive side of things? And it's, it's just mapping that out. Sometimes though drills, um, if they're designed well, can hit both. I've certainly had examples where if you get the intensive, you had the extensive alongside it as well. But sometimes it's not always appropriate to do that. So it's just mapping that out further so that you know what you're going after. And some of the popular uh, kind of football periodization models um, separate uh, strength days and endurance days, which is roughly the kind of intensive bias and extensive bias so again it's just having a plan and then working your plan yeah and i think martin if it probably brings us back right back to our first conversation really around um one of the the ways in which you start to unpick um the game pace training was around the tactical interaction mm -hmm. and you can see there that there's some certain positions on there that have only just reached the game pace and not quite the conditioning so is this now where where you guys are starting to to delve a little bit deeper around where this tactical interaction happens yeah that that is the next frontier for us is um like gps only tells you what you've done it doesn't really tell you much else it doesn't even tell you the direction you're running really mm -hmm. um so you, we don't know whether they're going forward or backwards or sideways um so that's the next level is putting that together with what's happening in the game so that example there is a good example of how we've started to do that with um, an extensive bias drill. We think that it tends to occur on counter attack and transitions. So that drill was structured in that way in order to achieve that extensive output. And similarly with the intensive, we think based on what we've done thus far, that it happens in that kind of um, high pressing situation or in one V one situations. So we, if we want to go after intensive, we may structure drills more towards that. But there's so much more work that could be done there um, to further understand that, which will only aid drill design further. So we can be quite specific about 
Um, the coach wants to go after X, Y, or Z that relates to the, the um, game plan. And we'll, we want, we need to get some kind of physical output alongside that. So that then really helps to build that drill design. Um, and like uh, in the video that Ruth kind of talked about there is there's a number of um, constraints you can put on the game, which then can further drive intensity. So good one in that example is the um, underloading a team that tends to drive up that work rate even more because obviously one team has to work harder, but also provides more opportunity for that transition from uh, defense to attack. Um, so that tends to drive the intensity up. Pitch size is obviously an important consideration as well, because if you're going after extensive and you have a really small pitch, they're not going to get that extensive because they don't have the space to run into. And similarly with intensive drills, erring on the side of smaller, but not too small, um, allows them to get that kind of high intensity Axel D cell. But if you go too small, they can't get into that high intensity because they can't build up enough speed. So it's just considering some of those factors there when you're designing your drills in order to make sure that um, you've kind of got all the levels nailed in. So this is what we're have, technically, tactically, physically, this is what we're trying to chase. And then these are the parameters that we're going to work with in order to make that happen. Yeah. So just as a, and you might not be here yet still, um, and it might fall into that, that tactical interaction, but do you guys work from um, a system of play or a style of play that either yourself or the opposition um, utilises and then look at the demands of that system or the style of play? Um, or is that something that you, you're starting to look into, uh, but it's more about just the game in general at the moment that you're trying to aspire to, to reach? Yeah, yeah. From a kind of um, global level, and probably given any definites to answer that, yeah, we're not at that stage yet. But it's certainly something that kind of happens within the MDTs for the specific teams, where there's the discussion about this is what we need to do. Like the first question I always ask the coach I work with is, "What do you need to do?" Um, and then try and understand what they need to do from a tactical perspective, um, and that sets well what we need to be kind of physically prepared for as well to an extent um but there's also the point about ensuring that we're prepared for the the kind of general demand because if if we're going to play in a certain way that biases it towards either intensive or extensive we still need to be prepared for the other thing because it's likely it's going to happen in the game and it's likely if it doesn't happen in that game it's going to happen in one of the other games that are coming up so we st we still need to have that kind of um broad idea of the things we're trying to do but yeah like we are trying to tailor what we're doing to the, the demands that are upcoming yeah perfect well martin you know we've covered probably such a, a small amount of of information and, and and things that we could really sort of delve even deeper into and it, it's definitely got my mind thinking but there's a, there's a few few things to consolidate that questions I'd like to, to pose to you. One, I think you touched on it slightly, first of all, this, this idea around the performance coach and the, the technical coach working together. What advice would you give to, to coaches in terms of this topic and how they can work best together to get the best outcomes for players? Um, yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, like, I think the biggest thing is that people need to park their egos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like ultimately it's not about uh, any discipline whether it's technical tactical physical whatever it's not ab about one being more important than the other the game is about all those things coming together as is with any sport um and so everyone needs to park their ego and not kind of um think that they know best and like and that's the point of like multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary teams isn't it is that they work together to solve the problem and so if you can be really clear of what that problem is that you're facing and then everyone inputs their bit to it um then it helps to come much better solution whereas if any one of those pieces try to solve it on their own it leads to a, a much worse solution which is massively one-sided um but it's it's a relatively simple game with a lot of complex things underpinning it as with most sports so having that various expertise and allowing that um open conversation and the challenge within that like that's probably the most productive environment to solve in the, the, the problem that you face yeah 
Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. It's something we talk a lot about around that cohesion in, in the teams, the multidisciplinary teams and that collaborative work process, which will only develop a, a world-class environment, whether it's WSL Championship or even within RTCs. And that, that sort of leads me into my, my next question to what advice would you give then to that RTC coach or that WSL Academy coach that maybe doesn't have a performance staff with them all the time or doesn't have gps what would be the, the single bit of advice you'd give to them in trying to develop this um putting you on the spot here a bit sorry yeah no i mean there's probably not one bit i think like there's probably two answers and they're, they're vastly different like it's going to take time for that person to build up necessary knowledge to do it all on their own so it's about building a network in the long term so that they can start to develop their own ideas and things like that. But ultimately, like I think in that situation, that person, if they don't have the MDT to rely on, they have to kind of make a plan and like put the plan into action and then see through trial and error what, what it does and what it doesn't do. And yeah. then from there to utilize the network to iterate that plan to make it work better in the future that would probably be the way that i would approach it yeah um, i don't know if that conforms to textbook answers in kind of that situation but that's that's probably how i think about it no i think it's a really good point i you know i like that we often talk to coaches around trial and error from their own point of view and not being afraid to fail and get things wrong and i think this is a this is a great example that where you don't have gps and you maybe don't have as much support around you that you you are going to have to try things and you're going to have to trust that your players give you an honest feedback whether it's rpe or whether it's the discussions around how hard but but educating themselves on on that periodization of understanding what intensive extensive training looks like is is something that they can go away and and, and do a little bit more for themselves yeah good and and sort of my my final point just to sort of to wrap this up is what well, what would you say is next in terms of we talked a little bit around the tactical element but but what what do you see you delving into further to, to be more even more specific now for working with national teams um i guess the two big things for us are embedding the peak game pace training into it yeah um like the graphics that we showed earlier they show that we're not achieving it so mm -hmm. we need to we need to work on doing that, which is for us is that kind of um, multidisciplinary approach to preparing our teams um, with the, the constraints that we have. And then the second thing is understanding further the interaction between the kind of game state and the, the peak game pace, because that will only further aid that design of drills and enable us to be much more targeted in what we do. Um, and so hopefully we, we um, have to go through less trial and error error because if we've only got a match day minus one we've only got one opportunity so mm -hmm. if you fail in that situation um it's not great <laughs> um and so we need to be be able to come up with that this it's this and we're going to do that no that's brilliant kelsey anything to add before we we, we conclude no that's brilliant thanks very much martin for sharing um your experiences and sharing some of the research that's been done like you said, that it's been a massive collaborative team effort, really, from from the whole department that's that's worked really tirelessly, especially probably over the lockdown period of collating a lot of evidence that is going to really support not only the national teams but hopefully um, ourselves in supporting the clubs and, and the club coaches watching and, and getting a little bit more of an insight into what this peak game pace is all about. So thanks very much for sharing. Yeah, no, thanks thank for having me. It's a good conversation. Cheers.